joining us for this month's episode of This Is My Story. In this podcast, we will sit down and talk to someone who has a powerful story of transformation because of what Jesus did in their life. My name is Jeremy Edwards, and this is my story. What an incredible opportunity to launch this podcast, uh, This Is My Story. Uh, and I cannot think of a better guest to have than Jeremy Edwards. Man, we go well, way thanks, back, Father. way back when, before Christ, right? BC. Right, right. <laughs> and so Maddie hears uh, you know, me tell stories way back when. And uh, man, just excited. And you know, when we began to pray, um, and God showed us that you know, we were supposed to have this platform of, of having people tell their story, um, immediately I thought of you. I'm like, man, we have man, met at boss, Chipotle, man. you know, God's place. Outside that's of Chipotle. Right. That's right. Chipotle. I um, hate Chipotle. Oh, <laughs> pray for her. I'm glad you'll go with him because I won't. For him. <laughs> but man, when we just prayed about that, I'm like, man, I knew that Jeremy was the right person for this. And, uh, you know, I wrote the, my book, Dylan Robinson, This Is My Story. And, um, you know, that's been incredible. But we knew that we wanted to have the opportunity to you know, give somebody a platform to share their story. Yeah. And we all have a following. And I'm not talking about Twitters and, and you know, Instagram and all that, though God uses that. But there's people um, that follow different people. They want to know like, what's going on with them. You know, where are they at? Um, you know, my grandparents always ask, how's Jeremy doing? Because you, know, mm-hmm. you have a following. You know, people <laughs> follow that. Right. And, and so this is what we're doing today, man. Just yeah. giving people an opportunity to share their story. And uh, man, I'm just excited to be able to sit down with you and uh, you know just share um, you know just funny stories from way back when you know um, some hard stories, some um, you know transformational stories, and all the above. And so, man, we just thank you so much for coming and joining us here today. It's an honor. Yeah, I love you guys. I'm so excited because I've obviously we've met multiple times, so so I know you, but I don't I don't know a lot of the backstory between you guys. So. (laughs) When when did you guys? You're meet? in for and a how, wild ride. Yeah, seriously. How and how have? old were you guys when you met? Um, I would say we were. Uh, well, I'll say it, I'll put it this way. I, I first I first met Dylan through his cousin Chet, and mm-hmm. I met Chet when I was in fifth grade. And really? So yeah, we started okay. playing basketball against each other, and then um, then of course I would play basketball at Chet's house, and then Dylan would be over there sometimes, and. DJ back then, right? DJ, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so, you know, we'd be playing uh, ball together, and then, um, yeah, that's when we first met. And I'd, so I'd say it was right around fifth grade to sixth grade when we first started meeting up. Yeah. Okay. Jeremy has a twin, Jesse, and they literally look identical, identical <laughs> twins. But back back then, before Bieber hair was even around, they had that's the Bieber. That's right. They used to comb it, right, every uh, time. I, I'd comb it, and I had that. <laughs> I had that Did flip. you get the flip? Yes. Yeah, I got uh, this neck muscle that gets a little sore. That I think is it's hilarious, man. That. Yeah. That's awesome. Yesterday. Okay, that's so funny. Yeah. So did you guys ever go to school together, or did you just know each other from running around with Chad? Um, yeah, we went to Hillcrest yeah. uh, for okay. a little bit right together. And In high school, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yep. so me, Chad, my cousin, Jeremy, and a whole bunch of people, man. Man, a whole bunch. <laughs> the, whole, the whole gang. Yeah. The whole gang, man. What kind of crazy things did you guys get into? <laughs> uh, I've heard a couple stories, but. <laughs> well, <laughs> where to start? Where to start? That's right. Uh, I'd say, you know, f- I think it first started when we were playing basketball together. We would be out all night playing basketball. I mean, yeah. I remember nights that we'd have tournaments against each other and we'd be playing We'd be playing pig and uh, knockout, just all types of stuff, yeah. and and then of course turn like we'd have like neighborhood kids, kids from Reed, PV, and then um, we'd come in just dog tired, like just drained, right. and then um, yeah, I'll let you go ahead. No, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Man, I remember you guys had this uh, little group called Scars. You know, oh, there yeah, was yeah. that, you know, show Jack Butt, if you will, right? right? That everybody watched. And so you guys had Scars where, you know, because in middle school, I went to Pleasant View, which is like the north side of Springfield, but a little bit nicer, you know, of a school, not really, but, you know, for north side. But then there was Reed, which was like the lower side. Yeah. And, um, you know, if, if you will. And that's where my best friends were, you know, Jeremy, Jesse, you know, Chet and all these kids. And so yeah. I remember us hanging out and my friends, from my school were like, why are you hanging out with those guys? I'm like, yeah, they're awesome, man. Yeah, And we would just go and do dumb things. I remember uh, in that scars group, you guys would just do crazy things. But you remember when we got in the, uh, uh, gosh, that shopping cart and we went down that ginormous (laughs) hill and we just tumbled and tumbled and tumbled. Do you remember that one? (laughs) Yeah. That shopping cart was 
man, I've got pictures by it. Like it, it was my first car or something. <laughs> and I had a, I had a, I broke a scooter and I stuck the steering wheel from the scooter, um, down through the, the middle of it. And then, you know, I had, I had, I was able to steer the front and so I could, you know, it was like a bobsled almost, you know, it was Crazy awesome. I remember one of the most clever things you did, um, which resulted in me doing is putting duct tape on our shoes. When it was yes. when it was snowy and icy outside, it was during the ice storm. Begin to slide <laughs> down, man. We were we were poor, so we got to get in, you know we had to get innovative, right? Right? Yeah, that's yeah. so well, funny. We made the best of every moment. <laughs> it was fun, man. Yeah. That's awesome. So I'll let you tell your story, but one last question. So, yeah. how did you guys stay such good friends? Because I I know a lot of times when I've seen you guys together, Chet wasn't there all the time. So how did that develop? You know what I mean? Yeah. Without, um, you know, I think um, in middle school, I always admired Dylan f for um, the way that he carried through through the things that he went through, but he also seen that I went through things, right. you know, really hard things that nobody should have to go through mm -hmm. yeah. um, on both sides. Yeah. And, um, but we both made the best of it. Um, you know, we seen everything from verbal, you know, mental and, you know, physical abuse to, um, you know, we see, we, I watched Dylan's family use and sell drugs in front of me. And I think likewise, mm -hmm. the same with him. He's mm -hmm. seen the same thing with me. Right. Sure. And, but we always had fun. We knew how to have fun. Mm -hmm. We still to this day, through all of the ups and downs, mm -hmm. we still have fun and we have a great time. But yeah. now it all points to Christ. Right. And, and so <laughs> yeah. it's great. Yeah. You know, cool. just, yeah. That's awesome. And I remember Jeremy, you know, <laughs> We were poor myself, but you know, like Jeremy, I think like 12, 13 years old, you had your full or part time job, you know, just yeah. crazy young. Mowing yards. Mowing yards, yeah. did everything. And I just remember, you know, I I had extra hoodies, I had extra shirts, and I love yeah. Jeremy. And he was such a, a generous person himself, but such Thanks a good dude. I'm like, yeah. take this hoodie, man, take this. <laughs> you know, we're just buds. And, yeah. you know, and I just, you had such a, you know, sincerity about you. You know, you, you just cared Thanks. so much about people and, and, uh, you know, ultimately now is through Jesus Christ, you know, just bringing us together. But, you know, yeah. I think it's funny just how the Lord has, you know, kind of made us like-minded even back then in the midst of our sin, in the midst of all of that, mm -hmm. you know, just, uh, you know, in the parties and, and, in the, you know, all the crazy things that we did, you know, I remember yeah. one particular time in Hillcrest, we were in the science hall and like five or six of us at like noontime, all, you know, crawled out the window <laughs> and we skipped school we're just walking down oh, you know just midday and, and just to see you know from there to now and i mean we could tell so many crazy stories stories like out that. of a movie oh, i man. never would have done that so many <laughs> stories so many stories but man oh. jeremy I, I know your story but i know there's some things in there details that I, i'm sure i probably haven't heard yet hmm. you know maddie hasn't heard and uh, you know, all the people watching and listening online, like they know Jeremy today and, you know, the one who just went through so much and, you know, tragedies and, but yeah, he has such a peace about him and all that. But mm. really, man, before um, the big tragedies in your life that we'll get to um, later on, and you, you had a rough go ever since you were a kid, you know mm. what I'm saying? So man, just tell us like your childhood, you know, what was that like growing up and, and just tell us kind of the details within that. Yeah. So, um, when, <laughs> When I was a, a child, I, I never really knew what to call home. I didn't really know. I was never really confident in, in to say, like, who mom and dad was or, hey, did, did does mom and dad, do they love, do they really love me? Like, do they care for me? Because I, I was pawned off on so many different people all the time. And, um, you know, from the time I was born, uh, well, I'll just say this. When I was born, I thought... Uh, I thought my stepdad that raised me, I thought he was my real dad. Mm -hmm. And so um, my real father, my biological father, I know this now, but back then my mom and my biological father split before I was even born. And she married another, she married a, a man. My, um, you know, so again, my, my mom and real dad never uh, were married and they were only together for about a couple months and they were mm -hmm. doing drugs and drinking a lot and just, you know, just doing a lot of bad stuff. And, and same with my stepdad though, even though he was a really good man to me, he was a really good father to me and I loved him mm -hmm. and he always stuck around. He was, he was there and he actually wanted to become my father. He was going to get custody of us. Yeah. Um, and so when I was, 
um, when I was about seven, I remember I was living in a trailer um, in Ozark with my stepdad and my mom was kind of in and out of the picture all the time. And um, we moved around a lot. And uh, but at, at this particular time is when, you know, when you're little and you can kind of start remembering things really well. It was about this time I remember when my my mom just was kind of gone too long. And I said, Dad, you know, I, was, I, would, I would get upset and uh, I'd cry sometimes. And I'd be like, Dad, you know, where's mom at? He, oh, she's working. You know, she's you know, she's out of state. You know, she'll be back. And I thought, this doesn't feel right. And I'd keep asking them. And then eventually another lady started living with us. And then later on in life, I found out that my mom had left state and she started dating another man. And um, there are so many fine details like that, that I had to find out later in life and piece together myself Mm -hmm. because I was, you know, lied to or not told everything. But um, so my mom came back into town real early one morning and she picked us up, uh, me and my twin brother. And I actually had another little brother named Jimmy and he, he was there with my stepdad. So my mom and my stepdad had my little brother, Jimmy, and my, but my mom came back and she came early one morning and said, Jeremy, just grab your bags, you know, like kind of in a panic. And she said, grab your stuff. We're, we're leaving. And I thought, what do you mean? I was supposed to go on a field trip that day. I was so upset. And um, I remember my mom took us to Springfield. We started living in this dump of a place, and she could hardly afford to take care of us. And uh, we lived there maybe, I want to say six months, you know. Um, and then we we moved from there to one of our friend's houses. And um, there that's when my mom started acting even different. Like, you know, like the, the men that were there, there was about two or three that were staying there and coming and going from the house. And we seen mo- like a lot of just, you know, money flow. Then we seen drugs and people using drugs. And, um, and our mom was parking around back and she would put a tarp over a car and we didn't, we didn't understand what was going on. And I'd ask her, and I remember my mom saying, don't you ask me that again. She said, quit asking about it. And she's told us not to play out in front. And I thought, you know, this doesn't make any sense. And the guys, she would be, she'd go off to work, and the guys that were there, they would do awful things to us. Like, you know, I remember there were a couple guys that would burn cigarettes on our arms. They would, you know, they would, I would, like, throw the cigarettes out of their hands or, you know, they would, uh, they'd be drinking in front of us and try and get us to take a drink or something. And I'd throw it or something. And then they would go and throw us and like hold me upside down over the toilet, you know, and like flush the toilet just to, you know, just, just to be jerks. I mean, just, just, yeah. And I would, I remember that's when I was, I was like having panic attacks and just freaking out. I just thought, you know, I didn't know there was a God, but I just thought, man, there's God, like, could you save me from this? But, you know, one day um, there's about seven sheriffs that pulled out front and we were like, uh-oh, like, what's going on? You know, are these guys in trouble? Well, they actually said my mom's name. They said, Lord, or, you know, and, um, and then come outside, you know, grab your boys. And um, th- then I remember seeing the cops with their guns and I don't know if it they had their guns drawn. I don't know if it was because that men that were inside, but they were also talking about the pit bulls that were out in front and they're, I'm sure afraid of getting bitten, but, um, they put my mom in handcuffs, took me and my twin brother and put us in this car. And, um, there were two men in the front seat and it was a station wagon. And my mom was, it was like a, like a terrible movie. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking out the, the back window and we're seeing our mom put handcuffs and they're just, you know, my mom's trying to get away, just, you know, like crying, just bawling her eyes out. And we're, of course, crying like, mom, mom. And and I just felt like it was the worst scene of a movie ever. And I, I, and, I and this man turns around and he's like, boys, it's OK. Calm down. You know, I'm going to take care of you. I'm your dad. And we're just like, what? And 
he's, you know, he said, I'm your father. I'm going to take care of you. It's okay. And, and then, uh, my, it was actually my uncle that was driving. He started driving away and I just thought, where's he taking us? And, and he took us to, to his home. You would never met him before. Is your biological dad? My biological wow. father. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. So that's and I went to his home and it was that's where my, my I found out I had an older brother named Clifton and I mean that was great meeting him but then I found out uh, you know about my cousins, my aunt, my uncle and and that night I remember I I was in such a, I was so overwhelmed. I remember I woke up in the hallway of of the house. Mm-hmm. I just thought I must have fallen asleep here, and I just, I just looked around, and I thought, where, you know, like, where am I? And I'm like, oh, no, like, and that started all replaying, right. and I'm like, right. and so, yeah, so that's how I met my real father, and that how was. How old were you, you think? I was, I remember it was right before first grade. Wow. So, wow. six, seven, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. So, Super yeah. young. Yeah, it was just wild. Man, you know, so drugs was, you know, immediate in your life, you know, yeah. and then you saw the abuse with your mom, and then you met your biological dad. Yeah. I mean, what was that like? You know, you um, you know, didn't know your biological dad. Um, yeah. Before that, did you ever ask about him, or did someone else, was someone else, um, you know, playing that role of your biological dad? You know, what was that like for you when you yeah. found that out? So, yeah, so I thought my biological father was my stepfather, but then when my real father got us, that's when I found out. But then, you know, years went by that I started living with my real father and later in life I found out that my father had actually only been clean off drugs for about a year Mm -hmm. so he was in church he kind of he started taking us to this Pentecostal church where you know I hated church I I wanted nothing to do (laughs) with it honestly (laughs) and the it was just weird and I won't say the name of the church but you know it was just too much when people were being thrown on the floor and they're just shaking I thought what is going on here you Mm -hmm. know but I, uh, I, I remember my, my dad had, um, just, he was really, he was always on edge and he was really just bitter and angry all the time. And just, your he, stepdad? my, my real dad okay. that I should start living with. Okay. And he, he was always on edge and, but, um, by the time we got in middle school, we, we had moved a couple of times, but I remember he started drinking quite a bit, and I thought, this is weird. This isn't the man I first met, you know, and um, he got, he was married her younger years, and, and they got a divorce, and, but I think that kind of started the play into some of it, too, but um, he, he had it, he, he was able to hide it really well that he was using drugs, but, you know, of course, at night, he was drinking, you know, six pack of beer at least, you know, every night. And then, um, when we got in the high school is when things started to get really bad because that's when, uh, my older brother Clifton started coming back around and throughout my older brother Clifton's years, he, he was in little cliques of like gangs and you know then he I remember there's stories like he called the house one time and he's he was crying and he he said I think you I remember he said he hey get dad get you know and and he's he had just been um pistol whipped tied up in a cornfield left for dead you know and yeah and so I remember he was bringing drugs around the house and my dad started using drugs with him again um you know other than what he was already kind of doing. And then I remember, you know, he started uh, using drugs with a neighbor. Well, then about that time is when my dad, um, his job moved to Oklahoma City. And he said, hey, boys, this, you know, I was a freshman or sophomore. um, And, you know, I was going to Hillcrest. And he said, hey, boys, we're going to have to move in. I thought, yeah, right. Like, I'm not moving. Like, you know, I've already been derooted from, detached from everything I've known. And you expect me to move with you. And after, you know, there's times that he would choke me and throw me up against the wall. And, you know, he would hit me. And um, we would get, we would always get in fights, verbal fights, just about little stuff. And 
um, I didn't, I really didn't think I was that bad of a kid. I mean, I'm sure I, mean, I was really honorary, like, of course, like mm-hmm. what we had already yeah. mentioned, but right. you know, stuff like that. You what know, was but, it like when, you know, the cops came in and took you away from your mom and then there you are with your biological dad. And then as the years went on, like, what was that relationship with your mom? Like, I mean, you know, was that in existence? Because when I met you in middle school, your mom really wasn't around to my knowledge, yeah. um, or at least you guys weren't, you know, didn't have the best relationship. So you know, what did that look like on your guys' end? Yeah, with my mom, yeah. she, we first, she, we couldn't see her at all f- for for about a couple of years, it seemed like. And then we had supervised visitation. Then she would get us like throughout the weekends. And, you know, honestly, I just hate to say it, but I, I didn't like staying with my mom because I felt like I wasn't valued or, you know, the times that I did stay with my mom, it was more about um, the things that we could do for, her, you know, it was just, it was really hard. We we would have some fun, of course. She was my mom, but yeah, yeah so, fun. yeah. Yeah, I know, you know, in our middle school years, we'd all um, get together, you know, 20 of us, right? And then by right. the end of it, we would all just... Can't imagine uh, 20 of oh you. God, it was crazy. <laughs> Michael McShane's... Oh, so oh, many yeah. people. It was <laughs> crazy. But, you know, I remember, um, you know, granted, I you know, come from dysfunction and all of that. Yeah. But, I, you know, I remember being at your house, you know, and there was, there was that um, stigma. You know, there was that, that tension within your home, I could tell. You know, mm-hmm. and you kind of walked around eggshells, you and your brother, Jesse. And, um, you know, just it seemed like there was a the lack of peace. You know, that might be a good way to describe it. And, yeah. you, you know, you're a peacemaker by yeah. nature. <laughs> yeah. um, but, man, you lived in such... Um, in dysfunction. Un- yeah, dysfunction. Yeah. And so, um, and I just remember that taking a toll on you, you know, and, and just, you know, trying to, you know, dance around, make sure everything's happy and, and, and peaceful. I mean, what was that like, man? Being just a, a middle schooler, you know, and just trying to keep it all together, you know, yeah. what was that like? It was a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my parents recognized that in me and, and they loved me for that. They admired me for that. And I love that they seen that in me because. I always wanted to feel loved. I, I never felt love. I never felt, you know, just compassion or, you know, any of that towards myself. It was, you know, hey, get out of my way. Hey, would you go get outside and get, you know, and, and or, you know, I something I struggle with today is self-condemnation. And I believe that's because I was condemned so much as a child. And, you know, really, you didn't even do anything at times. Right. It's just, it would lash out on you. It sounds like. Yeah. 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 I witnessed that. So, you know, he had a twin, Jesse, mm-hmm. and it seemed like, you know, me and Jesse and Jeremy and Chet, my cousin, uh, you know, he passed away a couple of years ago now, but we yeah. were inseparable. Right. But right. it would either be me and Jeremy or me and Jesse. And Chet <laughs> would be with the other one. And sometimes <laughs> we would all get together. Right. It's just, we'd funny. rotate. But my favorite memories would be, you know, at your house or my house, and I would just love to antagonize him oh, and his brother Jesse. He loved it. Jeremy's he the peacemaker. Now he does it to me. So. Yeah, no, Jeremy's the peacemaker. I'm a lover, baby. Yeah, yeah. I'm a lover. <laughs> and, and Jesse, it was a little. I mean, he was too, but I mean, he was a little bit more wiry, if you will. <laughs> yeah. And I remember just be like, try to get him you know, wild up. Like, Jeremy, are you gonna take that? And then yeah. Jeremy's like, yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Or, and he would stick up for himself. But Jesse, man, I could just get to him. And yeah. I would just watch Jesse and Jeremy start fighting, and I would just crack up every single time. You know, yeah, you and, caused it. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, I Jesse, can see that. Yeah, Jesse always had about fifteen pounds on me. Now more. <laughs> yeah. Not, not because he got fat, but you know, because I got skinny. <laughs> right. Right. He, got, right. he got fat too. Yeah. <laughs> but no, um, you know, I was, I was, I had to become a pro at choke holding people out. So. <laughs> Man, you just did that, yeah. awesome. dude. It was around that time. You know, obviously, you know, high school years. Um, but really you know, around that middle school time, you know, we started using drugs, you know, started doing the things of the world, you know, and, yeah. um, I had friends in Springfield and I had them in Marshfield and, you know, and you had your friends in Springfield and a lot of those friends were my friends too. Um, but man, like, it's funny, you and I both come from dysfunction. We know that drugs, you know, is something that causes so much hurt and so much, um, just dysfunction itself. Yeah. But yet there, we started doing the same thing, right. you know? And so, you know, what was that like for you to begin to experiment? You know, wh- why did you get into that? You know, some of the memories that we had together, you know, I mean, what was that about in your own perspective? Yeah. So for me, you know, I always wanted to fit in. Yeah. 
honestly. I I just wanted I wanted friends. I wanted family. I lacked family, so my yeah. friends were my family. Yeah. You you know, I call you a friend, but you're my brother, you know. Yeah. And so like the things that everyone else was doing, I started doing, you know, and I start, you know, of course I everyone started, you know, drinking and doing drugs and things like that. Of course, like I wanted to do those things. So uh but you know like for instance when like I lost my virginity like I was actually drunk passed out on a bed and I would just woke up and I there was a girl on top of me and same thing I started hanging out at some of your parties and I was l- drunk actually on the ground and there was one of your friends like putting weed in my face I'm like dude get out of here with that yeah. because that was one of the things I told myself I'll never do is drugs yeah. and um so it happened. I, I, I just was like, whatever. Like, little just by get, little. I, yeah. 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 And then I thought, well, there it goes. I already, I've already done it. I might right. as well keep doing keep it. Yeah. yeah. So, no, and of good. course, like I'm like a all in person. I, of course, when I started doing it, I started going all in. Yeah. Um, I think like, because I mean, there for a while, you know, when we were in high school, um, you know, I had moved, you know, I transferred from, uh, Hillcrest, you know, in Springfield, Missouri to Marshfield. And then we would just hang out on the weekends, it seemed like, you know, and um, at my my own grandparents' house, you know, I would I was throwing parties every weekend, you know, it was our, yeah. you know, it was our group. And, um, you know, that's when, you know, me personally, you know, I started you know, getting into prescription pills and, you know, mm. different things like that. And, um, you know, and you were doing things, you know, that you were doing, you know, within all that. And oh, I just, I, yeah. we, were, we were living in such darkness you know and i think like a lot of that was just to be cool you know we we're you know running the streets being hellions if you will you know but i think like deep down within there's that i think there's that void we we're trying to f- you know fill of like yes. well like you said perfectly we've already done it so let's you know let's do it with all of our might you know and yeah. you know i came from that family where we were just crazy and we we're gonna be crazy you know and i um and, and just watching, you know, how that just began to take a toll on me, at least I know in my life, it began to mess, you know, mess with me mentally and emotionally. But yeah, what about man. you, man? Because there, for a little bit, you know, there was that separation where, you know, I was kind of 30 minutes away and you were there mm-hmm. at the same place where you grew up on. I mean, what was your frame of mind? You know, I mean, how were you emotionally? How, how were you physically and all of that? Yeah. So during that time, that's when... Um, so my dad's job moved to Oklahoma city. Well, I had to start living, uh, you know, I, I had to just figure out where I was going to live. So I called, called around my family, even though I didn't really want to, you know, because I knew none of them could afford to really take me in, but there, um, I called my grandma and she was living with her sister and her sister had her son and her son's girlfriend and my grandma's son was living there too. And this was a four bedroom home. And then of course me and my twin brother moved in there. So it was chaos. Yeah. I mean, fighting all the time. And, yeah. and then, um, about six months went by my great aunt was just like, everyone get the blank out, you know? And I thought she was joking. So of course I just, <laughs> I just left for a bit. Right? You know? I come back. She goes, I told you to get the, and I was like, what? Wow. Like, and I, I was, I thought she was kidding. And I said, I left and I'm back. She said, I mean, get out of here. You're wow. not living here. Wow. So, yeah. So I thought, oh my gosh, she's serious. Like, and I just started living there not too long ago. And, um, I thought, man, I'm 16. Like, what am I going to do? And so I'd been hanging out with one of my buddies, Trevor, one of our good friends. And I put my head down on the fence and I was just bawling. I just, I was like, I don't know who I'm going to call. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I called him because Jesse had already um, decided he was going to live with one of our friends, Michael. And I thought, well, I don't want to overwhelm a family. And I thought, well, maybe I'll call Trevor and see what they say. And he said, hey, you know, um, let me ask mom and dad, see what they say. And then so then after I... um, yeah, after I called Trevor, his parents said, he said, hey, tell him that he can, you know, start living with us. And so he said, yeah, mom and dad said, grab your stuff and all your stuff. And I thought, what? Like, wow. mm-hmm. you know, I just couldn't believe it. From awesome. Literally found out I was going to, you know, 
be kicked out. Uh, I felt homeless. Mm-hmm. Or, of your yeah. own family. Yeah, right. my own family to then one of my best friends saying, yeah, you can come live with me. During, so during that time, I just thought like, wow, this is so awesome. And and I had, you know, I was using and selling weed yeah. and I was drinking a lot. And uh, like I was the go-to guy. So I thought, man, I this is this is nuts. Like I, I don't know how I'm gonna hide this from his parents though. Mm-hmm. So of course I tried to stop I stopped selling weed, but I couldn't stop. I couldn't fill I couldn't give up that void right. or you know, and or fill it with anything else. I didn't know like and I just lost all my family, so I just kept doing what I was doing, but I was just living with my friend and right. his parents mm-hmm. on the couch. Wow. And so um I want to ask yeah. you just real quick, what was that like, you know, your dad moving away because you, you were 16, right? Yeah. And your dad yeah. moved away and then you and your brother just left, you know, behind to just try to figure that out, you know, at 16 years old. I mean, for you, I'm sure it's just normal, you know, just surviving. But, you know, for most people, it's not, you know, that's not normal for you to have to do that. I mean, what was that like, man? Just like mentally, I mean, did it just did it break you down or were you just so numb to it that you just like, hey, that's life? Yeah, I mean, that was just life to me. But, you know, I I knew it was different because I would see my friends and I would compare myself to them. And I thought, this is just great, you know. And, like, I was, I was a little, I was always insecure of, like, what girls thought of me because I thought to have a good girlfriend, you know, I thought you had to have a nice home, a nice family, um, you know, have money in the family. And so that always played a toll on me and it always hurt, hurt me inside. So I felt like, man, I got to be somebody to, you know, I got to, I got to stand out somehow to, you know, make up for all that. And then, but so yeah, during that time, I just, it, it, it was really rough. Yeah. Uh, can imagine, dude. Yeah. You know, it was around that time you were living with Trevor, um, that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you ended up calling me. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so 16 is when I gave my heart to the Lord. And, uh, you know, God just radically transformed me. And mm-hmm. and I don't know if I've ever asked you, um, you know, it'd be funny with Maddie sitting right here, like <laughs> when you heard, you know, that... DJ Robinson. Yeah, that, that I got saved <laughs> and all that. I mean, what was your perception of that and, and reaction to everything that took place there? I thought... <laughs> 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 You get uh, out of here. I was like, funny. I just thought, what in the world? I thought, man, either God's really good or something's good. <laughs> or something's happening. Like, uh, did you believe it when you heard it, or were you like, oh, this is just? I mean, I believed it because I knew Dylan when he did something, he was going to do it. That's yeah, that's so, true. But oh, that's funny. you know, but when it, you know, <laughs> you're like, whatever. <laughs> you probably thought I was high and just, uh, <laughs> man. Uh, you know, so we, you know, that took place, and yeah. um, you know, so I. You know, I was living with my youth pastors and, you know, so I had a unique situation myself. But yeah. I remember one night um, I got a call from you and I hadn't talked to you in a little bit. And I was like, oh, it's Jeremy. Yeah. And um, man, like that's when you just began to just spill your heart out to me. And like it was so evident the Lord, you know, had spoken to you. So I mean, mm. kind of tell everybody, what was that like, man? Because I was the recipient of that. I'm like, and I just remember one thing saying, bro, that's the Lord. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's the Lord. Yeah. So yes. tell me about that. Yeah. So. You know, during this time, I was living with my buddy Trevor, and then I was also uh, doing heating there. So mm-hmm. I was driving back and forth to Ozark, and I'd already been going to church during this time. So, of course, God was working on me, yeah. whether I knew it or not. And um, I was uh, going to – I remember I was I was 16 going to church hungover, you know. Mm-hmm. And Were you going by yourself or with a family? I was going – yeah, I'm glad you asked. Uh, my – you know, Seth Thomas, he invited me and, uh, you know, Seth wasn't always there, but his sister was, and I thought she was pretty darn cute. So, <laughs> so that's why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> By all means, win some. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, that kept me, uh, you know, his family took me into, they loved on me, cared for me, and always asked me, like, hey, do you want to come to lunch with us, or hey, do you want to come to um, Easter with us, and um, but during that time, I went. I was working, and I was going uh, to Ozark back and forth. And I remember I had these long drives, so I had a lot of time to think to myself. You know, <laughs> I was driving all the way to um, basically um, 
Well, it was out towards Crystal Cave, basically out to, past Pleasant View, to, all the way to Ozark back and forth. So that was a good 30, 45 minute hard, you know, drive. And so I was out there and um, I remember I was broken, literally broken. Me and my girlfriend that I had during the time, we were fighting and bickering a lot, you know, just young pup stuff. And then, you know, so that, of course, was weighing on me. But then I thought, gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do when I move out of here. And Jesse actually moved out of Trevor's because the parents started asking for rent. And uh, it wasn't much, of course. But, you know, when you're working part time, you're going to school and, you know, all you can think about, you know, is money. Like, mm. I just thought, you know, I just don't know what, I just felt useless and I just felt horrible for living in sin, but going to church at the same time. And uh, so I remember as I was driving back from work and also my boss was a jerk. He was always cutting me down, calling me names, saying, you know, it was just, it was, it was just the stuff he said to me is really, it was just awful. No need for it. Um, but I remember I always, I loved country music in high school. I still love some, but you know, I was, I, I thought, you know, I need, I need something better. And so I turned on 88.3 The Wind <laughs> and I was like listening to some Christian music. And of course, you know, it always makes you feel a little bit better, but I, I remember there was a particular song. I don't remember what it was, but I, I remember I started praying the words instead because, you know, I was, I didn't really know I was praying the words, but I was, I was saying them to God. Like, I remember they were saying things like, God, would you restore my heart? God, would you break me? God, I was already broken, but I was just saying, God, like, I need you, God. And I was, I just, I was crying and I just got really emotional and I said, God, would you just change my heart? God, would you come into my life? And so I asked God into my life right then and, and I, I distinctly remember I got like goosebumps up mm-hmm. my back and I was, I felt like a cat walking around with, you know, the hair standing <laughs> yeah. on the back of my head, you know, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I felt like God had wrapped his arms around me and said, Jeremy, I love you, son. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt like he said, son, come follow me, you know, and, you know, people say like they don't hear it audibly, like, you know, I didn't hear it audibly, mm-hmm. but I felt that man, right. there was nothing, I can't deny that. And no one can ever take that from me. And so I remember um, there's examples in the Bible, but I remember uh, as I reflected on this, God told me to go tell my brother Clifton what happened. And I didn't want to because I was I wanted to go tell people what happened. But and my brother, my older brother, he was high and and I went and told him what happened. And of course, he was passed out and like on the couch and he was he had some really hard drugs on the coffee table and I thought, I don't know what I'm doing here, but okay, God, you know? So of course I tell him, but right. then I, I remember God distinctly told me, Hey, you got some things that you need to get rid of yourself. And so I went to Trevor's house and even though I didn't always sleep in Trevor's room, um, there are things of mine that were in Trevor's room. And that was, you know, I had like a gallon of whiskey be on his bed. I had some chew and I had some weed. And, uh, you know, I get home. Um, it was after work and um, Trevor's parents were sitting in the living room. And I thought, you know, I need, God was telling me to go grab that stuff and take it and dump it out. Right. And And I knew it was like imperative that I did it right then. Mm. But I was scared at the same time. I thought, I can't just jump out the window, you know. <laughs> so I went, I grabbed this stuff. I had this gallon of whiskey. I had some weed. I had a couple cans of chew, and I'm walking. I'm just like, guys, I'm really sorry. I'll explain here in a minute. <laughs> so, but, so I walked, you know, I walked out of there. You know, I wasn't ashamed, but I walked out kind of, in, co- you know, in confidence, yeah. knowing that, hey, this is from the Lord. It doesn't matter. Right. Caught on guard. They were yeah. like, okay. Uh, yeah, they, were, they looked at me, and I was just like, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, I came inside and I said, "Hey, you know, I'm really sorry, guys. I, I was really disrespectful of me to do that, um, to hide those things from you in your own home." 
And they said, hey, you know, we understand, but just please don't do that again. I thought, <laughs> I promise. I you know, so. Um, that's hilarious. Yeah, so I, um, I, that's when I went back outside and I, I remember I just, I was walking up and down the road, just kind of pacing. I felt uneasy and I felt like, man, I got to tell someone about <laughs> this. And, and I thought, this is too good not to share. And mm-hmm. I, so Dylan was the first person that came to mind. And because, you know, one, you had just gotten saved, but we were close, like we, and we had done so much crazy stuff and, but you had been saved, like he had been transformed. Mm-hmm. And I thought, this is God working on me like that. Like, <laughs> right. I just thought, gosh, Dylan's going to get this like no other. Right. Yeah. And you said, I, rem- I distinctly remember, dude, that's the Holy Spirit. You, you got <laughs> to act on that. Yeah. Right, so, man. Yeah. It, was so, it was so cool. And like for me, it was such a uh, reassurance to like God telling me early on, Dylan, I'm going to rescue not only you, but your mm-hmm. friends and your family. And I'm like, okay. You know, I didn't know what that yeah. meant, but I'd kind of went through some trials you know, with my own friends, you know, my own family. They weren't really serving the Lord. And uh, when you called me, I was like, let's go. (laughs) Like, let's go, you know. And, uh, man, it's just been so cool to just watch your faith journey, you know, ever since then, man. And But, um, man, I remember uh, I was in college a couple hours away. But I I, this particular weekend, I was at home. And I was staying at a buddy's house. And uh, we stayed up late. And, you know, I woke up. And I had, like, literally hundreds of texts and calls, like mm-hmm. missed calls. I was like, what in the world? Like either I got famous overnight, which I really doubt <laughs> happened, or something really bad happened. Yeah. And so I just clicked on like the first, you know, the, the first message. Um, and it was a voicemail. And it was your brother, Jesse. And um, he said, DJ, this is uh, Jesse. He said, Jeremy was in a wreck. And he said, um, it's not looking good. He said, I need you to call me. And man, I just got sick to my stomach. And I just... I said bye really quick to my friends and their family, and I just drove up, man. I just remember, like, crying, like, on the way to the hospital, and I just said, mm-hmm. Lord, like, not now. I mean, that dude, right. this guy's had a rough go at it. You know, he's, you know, living for you and, you know, and, and, and mm-hmm. you're trying to do better and, and just all this, you know, all these things that's taking place, and now this, you know, like, why? And I just remember crying, like, Lord, please don't take him right now. Please yeah. don't take him right now. I remember just, you know, praying that over and over. Well, once I got to the hospital, um, I mean, dude, there were, there were so many people. I've never seen so many people in the waiting room in my entire life. And I hadn't seen a lot of these um, people since high school, you know, or, you know, when I was in uh, at Hillcrest and, you know, sometimes, or some of them even middle school, you know, and so they hadn't seen the Christian version of me. <laughs> and so I walk in and just hundreds of people just look at me. And, you know, they knew I was a um, pastor in training. Yeah. And uh, and I just remember somebody grabbed me and said, we got to pray. And I said, okay. And and we just had a bunch of people all get together. And I just started praying for you. And, you know, everybody was praying for you. And, uh, you know, nobody could go back there except for, like, you know, intermediate or uh, intermediate family. And, uh, but because I was a pastor, I was allowed to go back there. Oh. And uh, me and your brother, Jesse, went in there and, and man, I was just like, Lord, prepare my heart because I had no idea, you know, what to expect. And yeah. when I went back there, I mean, your head was so swollen, you know, from the fluids and the wreck and the damage and all that. The trauma. And the trauma. I mean, it just, I, I mean, it just, I was speechless. And I just remember just putting my hand on you, you know, and, and Jesse was right there and we started talking and praying and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and your little vitals you make it made sounds. I'm like, he's got to hear me. I'm, I'm believing that. Right. <laughs> Um, but man, yeah. I just remember just thinking like, Lord, what's going to happen? And, uh, you know, and so people just stayed and stayed and stayed. And finally, you know, a few days into it, the hospital's like, Hey, you guys got to go. And, um, but you know, a few people continued just to stay and, um, came to the point in time where I had to go back, um, to, to school and to my job. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't know. I think they, you know, they didn't give you much of a chance to live or anything like yeah, that. Like, they said five to five, 10%. Wow. Yeah, 5% chance to live. For three, yeah, And I was just days. like, man. And so, you know, it wasn't looking very good. And so anyways, man, I, I went back and I just told Jesse and you know, everyone, hey, let me know. Like, I'll I'll drive down again. Just, you know, wow, let me man. know. And uh, dude, and I re- never forget, I don't know who told me, but, you know, they told me Jeremy woke up. I'm like, no way. 
I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And so my two thoughts went to my mind. Number one, praise God. What a miracle. Yeah. Number two, whoa, what does this look like now? Mm -hmm. You know, because they told me, you know, hey, he's paralyzed um, from the waist down. Um, you know, it's going to be a rocky road, um, but, mm -hmm. you know, we think he's going to be all right. So we, you know, number one, we continue to pray because just because you woke up didn't mean, you know, that you're going to be fine initially. Mm -hmm. um, but, man, I just remember, you know, just people giving me updates and um, because, you know, they weren't really letting many people see you or anything like that. Um, but, man, I remember when I was able to come down and by this point in time, you're up, you know, you're moving, you're talking. And but I, I was scared. Like, I don't know if I've ever told you this. Like, I was like, I was nervous to see you just because really? like, I didn't know, you know, what it would be like, you know, I'd, I'd never seen Jeremy in this new state, you know, and, yeah. and dude, like, what's that gonna be? And dude, I walk in that room and you go, hey, man. <laughs> and I was like, that's Jeremy, though. Yeah. I mean, dude, that's you like, like, oh, to thanks, a T, bro. like, you know, just crazy. He's a story. And we're, you know, I want you to talk all about it. But yeah, the first thing I see is you in this, you know, rehab center. You go, hey, man, how's it going? <laughs> and I was just like, dude, only you, man. Like, like that's always been you, the, the happy guy, the the peacemaker. and The bounce back kid. Yeah, the bounce back <laughs> You know, your life just, you know, got turned upside down and there you were joyful. And so, you know, that's mm -hmm. my perspective. That's my mm -hmm. side of it. And, you know, we'll talk post-rec in a bit. But, man, yeah, what trauma? I mean, yeah. what? I mean, I can't even imagine. So I'd just love for you to talk like, you know, pre-rec, like do, what do you remember? And then the rec and then post-rec, like what was that like, man? Yeah. yeah. So let me say first that I, you know, of course I had been radically saved by Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I changed and, um, you know, I found so much peace and just, I'd felt so free through Christ. And, but I was going back into the same environment you know, expecting a different outcome. Yeah. And of course my, my environments kept changing. So I lived, I, I moved out of there because I just thought, well, Jesse's living on his own. Like maybe, maybe he of course found some deal where he could live in a, his own home at 16 or 17 and was paying rent and uh, living on his own. And I started living with him and things just got too crazy. I mean, people were still in my clothes and they were go they were drinking a lot. And I just thought, this is everything I didn't want, you know? And like, I knew I kind of had an idea it was going to happen, but I didn't know. I thought like maybe I could somehow make it all better. And of course it didn't. And then, so I moved from there to uh, my buddy, Austin Sherman's and he was a wonderful, he's one of my best friends, you know, and his parents, God love them. They're so awesome and uh, so encouraging. And then I, the stipulation there was that I, I, if I was in school, I was going to college and working like 40, 60 hours doing heating and air. And um, that's when I knew that uh, like work was too much. Like, but I couldn't quit working because I was also supporting myself. I was just living under the roof, you know. So I was like, guys, I'm sorry. I got to move out of here. So I moved in with um, my buddy, uh, Jamie, which is a terrible mistake. I, I just, same stuff, same stuff. And then, you know, I moved in with my grandma for a bit. Her husband uh, had just passed away, and, you know, not, not, you know, long before, I, you know, after, like I moved in there. And then um, I had to move out of there, so I moved in with my older brother, uh, Jeff. And that's when I had just bought my motorcycle. That's when um, I had started drinking a lot. Cause that's like everything that he did. He, you know, he was all about drinking and grilling, hanging out with friends and things like that. So of course I started doing those things with him and, um, bought the, bought the motorcycle and, um, I was riding around town. Like, I, I mean, I actually drove to Florida and back with, uh, Seth Thomas and some other friends and my friend Trent and, um, but, I came back to town and I was riding with these other friends and I was still trying to do good. I mean, I was still going to church on Wednesday nights. I was, you know, going to church. At, it was at a different church. And then I was going to my church on Sundays and, uh, you know, but I just could not, I couldn't, I couldn't quite commit because I was still trying to fill this void. You know, I didn't quite understand the significance of my testimony. Like, 
of this radical change, you know, how God had changed, moved in my life. And so I was living two different lifestyles. And I thought, of course, you know, people aren't going to see that. Like, and people don't, they're going to understand or whatever. Well, I had uh, been riding all the t- with my friends a lot. One, one of my buddies said, hey, you know, um, you should come ride with us. And I'd actually hurt my ankle the night before on that motorcycle. And I knew I shouldn't have gone. But they were like, oh, come on, man. Don't be a chicken. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, they were calling me something else. And so I went out and rode with them. And um, it was about 1130 at night. And there was no cars out, nothing. And I was going southbound on Kansas Expressway. And so Kansas Expressway between Mount Vernon and Grand Street is a long straightaway. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were riding and there was always this, like, look or the sound, you know, someone to make, and that means, like, okay, let's go. And so my buddy looks over at me and revs up twice, and I knew that meant, all right, we're going to race. So we take off, and I get out in front of everyone, and um, um, when you come up to Grand, there's a Walgreens off to the right, and then there's uh, a little bit of a curve, and I started slowing down, and my bike started wobbling really bad, and that's where my memory starts to fade out, and I don't remember anything. But um, my friends told me that my bike, my motorcycle starts uh, wobbling really bad, and they call it the death wobble. And um, like I, they said, I was just going from side to side, and and it kind of veered me off, and um, I I hit the yield like you would yield onto another road. I hit that concrete median. And, but I think what happened is I actually laid my bike down over on the left side. Or I'm not exactly sure. I'm just trying to figure this out myself. But my bike went flying, and it flew completely over an intersection, flew into a water culver that wraps around where Walgreens is. And um, then I was laying in the middle of the road, and my, um, my friend said that when they wrapped around and came back towards me, and they looked at me, he, he just couldn't believe it because my leg was looked like an S because I broke my femur in four different spots, and I, I broke my clavicle and my, um, my collarbone. You know, I, um, the end bone right here is called your acromion process, and that is broken off, and it's just sitting there floating. Like, I can't raise my arm up you know, past my head because that bone is just sitting there. And then, um, you know, I cracked my skull in a couple different places. And um, so I had a brain injury. And then um, you said you'd seen my face all swollen up. Well, I also had um, I had spinal fluid coming out my eyes and my ears. And um, spinal fluid was leaking out. And um, I broke my back in a couple different spots and fractured my neck and my ribs um, broke so many times that it actually punctured my lungs. So that's why I'm kind of soft spoken. Mm -hmm. And, um, so they had to put a trach in my throat You can kind of see this little scar here. And so then they also cut me up my stomach and they had to take out my spleen, my gallbladder and my appendix because of all that swelling you had mentioned. So, um, you know, uh, of course I had road rash and all, all types of other stuff. And I remember when I got my clothes, they sent me so they sent me home with this brown bag and I I had other stuff with me that people brought to the hospital so I didn't really look at it but I pulled it out and it, and it was the shirt I was wearing um, I remember I was wearing um, some boots uh, some jeans a black tap out shirt and an Under Armour hoodie and I didn't have the hoodie I don't know where it went but I got I got my shirt back. And so that was underneath my hoodie, and it was just shredded. I didn't even know it was a shirt. And I picked it up out of the bag, and I, I'm holding it over my lap, and all this white stuff's falling off of it. And I just thought, what was that? And that was my skin, all from all the road rash up, oh. up my arm, and I came off my arm and stuff, and wow. I, I about threw up. And it's just, like, I love keeping souvenirs and things for memories, but that was something that I knew I, I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Like, um, wow. but yeah, so. I mean, dude, what was that um, like? The, I mean, do you, do you recall the first moment you woke up after the wreck? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I woke up and 
the f- actually, well, yeah, yeah, no, the first time I woke up, I um, was coming out of an induced coma. Mm-hmm. And so my brother was sitting there next to me and he heard me, he must have heard me making a noise or moving because he was sitting over there holding my hand and he said, doctor, you know, and he's like, doctor, hey, you know, he's waking up and um, I'm just kind of, you know, it's, it's just like in the movies, like you kind of come and you're like looking around and you see the bright lights and, you know, you feel like you just woke up from a nap and of course I had all these pain medicines going through me, so mm-hmm. I didn't feel a thing, but I couldn't move or anything. My brother kept telling me not to try and move and I was like, okay, you know, and, and, but he was like, Hey, you know, Jeremy, I hate to say this to you. And all right. Um, but the doctor said, you're never going to walk again. And I thought, Jesse, I don't even know what's going on. Like, and so he had to tell me what happened. And Mm -hmm. so he told me and I thought, Oh my gosh, like he's right. Like I I started to kind of remember like, Oh, I'm, Oh, like I'm not going to walk. Oh, because I must have wrecked my motorcycle. Oh. And I thought, wow. Like, and so, you know, of course, I, I couldn't quite remember everything that was being told to me. So they'd have to repeat it all mm-hmm. over. And I, you know, I'd, I sustained a brain injury. So at that time, it's hard for me to kind of process things, but also remember things. Right. So they kept telling me all of that. And so now, of course, it all stuck. But, right. you know, wow. So, I mean, granted, you know, you went in and out. And so it's hard to really remember. But like, what was your immediate reaction? Was it, you know, scared, angry, you know, sad? I mean, yeah. like, well, can't man, imagine. I still had God in my heart, right? So, right. so I, I just, I said, it's, it's okay. Wow. I said, it's going to be okay. Like, <laughs> that was, that was your crazy. first reaction. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to bounce back from this. Wow. wow. You know, like, I thought that was my initial reaction. It's like, well, nothing's going to change. Like, I'm just going to go back to normal. Wow. Like, you know, and, so I didn't realize, you know, all this rehab and everything that else was coming in the future. Wow. So I mean, I can't imagine um, the perseverance, you know, within the you know, the rehab and all of that. Dude, what was that like? I mean, just day in and day out. I mean, just relearning to live, essentially. Right. And how yeah. long yeah. was that process? How yeah. long did it take you? Yeah, I mean, from the time I woke up until the time I left the hospital was four months. And they, they actually wanted me to stay longer, but I just couldn't. I was at a point where... They kept saying, like, hey, we want you to stay at the hospital. But, you, you know, like, I kind of got the hint that I could go home at any point. And my mom was actually in the room with me the whole time. And um, that's another story. But I couldn't handle being in the room with her anymore. And then we were fighting all the time. And But I remember, you know, throughout rehab, the rehab Part was about a, a month and after I was healthy enough I so I went to Mercy Hospital and then I had to go to select specialty hospital um, where I had to stay and have rehab where I could heal properly mm-hmm. so that I could go through this intense rehab then I started learning how to dress myself getting out of cars transfer um, I was they wanted to show me how to do willies. I'm like, right on. Like, you know, so I love that. And they That's called, funny. Yeah, they call me the Willie King. <laughs> yeah, because it's going up and down tramps, like doing willies. And, Dude. Yeah. So. I mean, through all that, I mean, your faith was there, right? I mean, God, you know, God is king, right? And He's, I had some amazing prayer warriors, people coming in, right. seeing me. But man, yeah. um, th- actually, just a side note, like how, m- I remember you telling me this statistic, how many pints of blood did they give you? Over 76 pints of blood during yes, that time. Yes, it was wow. the most that they had given anybody. That's what I and thought. If you go into the, the community blood drive center, you'll see my picture. <gasps> wow. Yeah, up on the wall. It's, <gasps> that's it's pretty wow. crazy. It's pretty wow. surreal. Crazy. That's yeah. crazy. That, that's a lot of blood, man. I could say I'm a poster child. <laughs> 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 you know, so, I mean, your faith is, you know, was strong, but man, like, you had to, you know, relearn to live, essentially. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine the emotional, you know, just mental battle if you will you know just through that like yes i love god yes i'm you know i'm you know adjusting back to life but like 
what was that like? I mean, was, were there hard times? You know, just oh, like, did you have yeah. resentment towards God, towards others? I mean, what was that like, man? Yeah, once once I started realizing that I was going to have to live with pain and, um, you know, I didn't know where I was going to live after. That that That's when, like, life starts setting in. Like, wait, I'm not always going to be in the hospital. Like, where am I going after this? Because my older brother, him and his wife split up. And so, of course, they weren't living together anymore. And I thought, oh, where am I going to go now? You know, and my grandma wasn't living with her sister anymore. You know, I mean, I, I had no idea where I was going to go. And um, the resentment, or if there was any, was, okay, what's life going to look like now? I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't put my head around all of that. And I just, I mean, I just gotten established, like, when I was living at my brother's and I had my motorcycle, before that I had two cars. And um, hey, there's a term called hood rich. I was hood rich, brother. I mean, I had two cars. <laughs> I was living with my brother. I bought a motorcycle. And I thought, man, I've arrived. Like, I made it. And then that happened. And then I started thinking, like, oh, man, like, what am I going to do for work? And then, yeah, so there was all of this, like, these thoughts, like, oh, God, I've always worked with my hands, like, what am I going to do? So, mm. yeah, it was I mean, tough. To you know, so then, like, you found a place to live, and, you know, then you're, you know, adjusting to that, you know, happening to depend on people at first, you know? I mean, yeah. now, I mean, you just got it all figured out more than me, right? I mean, you <laughs> yeah, just, right. you go in and out. But, <laughs> I mean, you had to, you know, essentially become somewhat dependent on some person. Yeah, and for you, to. you've been an independent person your entire life. Right. You know, um, as early as I remember, you know, you're independent, you're doing this. What was that like having to you know, be dependent upon somebody? You know, I mean, was that hard to ask? Oh, gosh. There, I mean, I found out that not only was I didn't realize how independent I was, but how prideful I was because there's a lot of pride in that you have to let go of and strip away right. to say, hey, I need help. Mm-hmm. Right. But yeah, that's it's, even to this day, it's it's a struggle. Yeah. And being a, being a male, I mean, I think men just want to, say, you know, we're going to pick up our bootstraps. We're going right. to do this ourselves. But right, you Andy being a young man, yeah. you know, but yeah. yeah. Did you, um, you know, you mentioned you had pain. I mean, still today, I mean, do you live with physical pain from the wreck? I mean, what's that yeah, like? Yeah, yeah, it comes and goes, of course. I feel like an old person when, you know, when the weather changes, <laughs> right. the pain kind of comes sometimes. And it, it's not always there, but wow. yeah, so that's hard. And um, afterwards, I, you know, um, I had some muscle pain that I experienced, and we talked about this one time. We would drink. Me and Dylan had got, have gone through these different seasons of anxiety, and we, I mean, thank God we weren't reaching for anything else, but we were <laughs> drinking a lot of water. Yeah, and it flushed out my electrolytes, mm-hmm. and it and so it caused a lot of muscle tension, right. yeah. and so that caused some pain, and I just didn't understand, and I lived with that for a while. And, right. Yeah. I mean, dude, I can't think of someone who's you know, you, you use the word or your phrase bounce back better than you have, right? <laughs> but in that, man, you know, we've talked. You know, you've had um, identity issues within that. Um, yeah. You've had frustrations. You've had insecurities. You've had pain, uh, mental, emotional, physical, right? Yeah. I mean, dude, why have you been able to keep your faith in God? But also, I mean, you know, it hasn't been so easy either. I mean, tell, tell us, you know, I mean, how have you been able to keep that faith in God and what was that like processing through those doubts and frustrations? Yeah, well, you know, after my accident, I told you I didn't know where I was going to live. And um, I ended up moving in with my grandma. And then there was this sweet family that came around and they asked me if I wanted to move in with them. And it was the family that I was going to church. Um, I never met them, but it was a family that I was going to their same church on Wednesday nights. And I thought, wow, man, God is good. And like, I just thought that's great. And so I lived with them for about three years, three plus years. And, um, until some things happened and that, you know, I couldn't quite trust them anymore. And, um, I, I had to move out and just some things happened. I just, I knew it was time for me to move out and I moved into my own apartment. And that's when I started to realize like, wow, like, you know, there's a lot that you, need to work on Jeremy and that you aren't you aren't working out with Christ and and there's something about living alone you know just like in the Bible it talks about people being 
off in exile or, you know, um, God sends people out in the wilderness for 40 days and just breaks them, you know. I've been broken over and over, and it's allowed me to work on myself. And, um, you know, but there's so many times that I've struggled where I haven't reached out to Christ, you know. I fell back into sin. Um, you know, I started, like when I told you I was dealing with anxiety, like the anxiety got worse when I started living on my own right. and like thinking like uh, my identity issue was in work, who I was as, like what yeah. I was, who I was going to become yeah. because I told you I was going to be working with my, like I always worked with my hands and, you know, I remember, you remember how I'd always work on your car stereos yeah. and, you know. <laughs> kept you up till like two in the morning. <laughs> yeah, it out. man. So like I, I love doing stuff right. like that, but um, I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. And like I was telling you about, you know, finding kind of like trying to impress girls with like my career, mm-hmm. things like that. Um, I thought, man, I'm nobody. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and that whole time God was sitting back like, mm-hmm. bro, like he, he wasn't saying bro. He was saying, <laughs> saying son, you know, I love yeah. you. Like, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm sitting here waiting for you. And this whole time I'm, I'm trying to, make things happen and, and I have war conversations, war relationships out where I'm saying, okay, what, what am I going to be good at guys? What am I going to do? And, and my anxiety was getting so high. And, and then I went and I actually became a jeweler and I was doing really good at that. I went to school in Tennessee and I was doing, I was succeeding really well in that. And I thought the Lord was calling me to do that because I love, I'm a people person. I love making people happy and I love uh, just doing things like that. And, uh, I thought, man, I'm doing a doing a win win. I'm working with my hands. I'm um, uh, doing the Lord's work, and then um, it didn't work out. And then my friend said, uh, he, "Actually, this I got a job offer down in New Mexico. They flew me down there, stayed there a whole week, and they wanted to have me come on as their full time jeweler, and they wanted to make sure I was the right fit. And uh, well, I, you know." things just didn't quite work out like I thought. Like I just kind of start growing cold feet towards it. And, you know, but I, I talked to him one time. He said, Jeremy, I don't understand. Like, what well, he goes, you were so, you were obsessed with this. You were so passionate. You had a zeal for it. And now all of a sudden you don't want to do it. And it's like, man, it's like I'm back behind the bench and I'm not, I'm not working with the people. I'm not, you know, doing what I felt like God wanted me to do. And so I felt like I was trying to make all of this 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 God plan work mm-hmm. f- for myself when it wasn't it might not have been all for God you yeah. know and and so but he called me one time and said hey you know I think you it sounds like you got an identity issue and I was so mad <laughs> who are you I was like who are you to be saying I've got an identity issue like of course I know I love God and but it made me check myself yeah. of course you know it humbled me and mm-hmm. I thought man he's right. right and i called him not so long ago and thanked him and said man you're you're exactly right i i had an identity issue you know and i was trying to find my identity and who i was as an employee is what my work was going to be how i was going to impress people you know um just my performance in general and um and all this time god set me down to say jeremy i love you like you know, I've given you a story, use it, mm-hmm. you know, and I've got a, I've got this powerful testimony. Yeah. I didn't find this. I, I didn't see the significance in it. Right. I didn't see how many people I could reach, you know? And right. So, you know, some people have you know, went through a lot and they've had resentment towards God, you know, but it seems like that really hasn't been the case with you um, or has it, you know, or how, if not, how have you, been able to really not have resentment towards God, but, you know, rather have an opt- optimistic outlook. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, well, I didn't always have that look, outlook on life. Um, you know, like I said, I fell back in the sin, and I was I was trying to fill a void, like you talked about earlier. I was trying to fill this void again. Even though I had Jesus in my life, I stopped looking to Jesus, mm-hmm. you know, and I start letting people back into my life that I should have kept that distance with. And there was people, friends and family members I start hanging out with and um, 
of course, they were doing things that weren't right, that that God calls us not to do, such as, you know, I told you I was stressed and I started smoking weed. Well, I started doing that a lot, and, and it drug me down. I mean, it, it, it made me really anxious, made my anxiety worse. It made me really depressed. I felt like I couldn't connect. I felt like I was in between, like a lukewarm Christian on the fence, you know, but it drug me to that side, and I thought, this is not me. And I, I remember laying on my couch, and I thought, Honestly, I don't, it's really hard to say this, but like I did, I, there was times I didn't want to be here anymore. Mm-hmm. And because I didn't, I had, I, the, I had that identity issue mm-hmm. of who am I? Yeah. I'm a child of God, mm-hmm. but I wasn't finding, I didn't right. see that. Right. You know, I was trying to, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, find man. myself in, in the, this earth and I'm not of this earth anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. So, That's right. That's powerful, yeah. man. So dude, I mean, what would you say? I mean, as we end here, like, what would you tell people? Like, hear your story, you know, from the very beginning to now. You know, I mean, what would you tell them? Like, just, you know, uh, you're such an inspirational guy. You went through so much, you know. Like, if they're sitting here, though, they're like, man, I'm discouraged, right? You know, I had a hard upbringing or I've had this disaster upon my life and I'm just really struggling to have joy and, you know, really struggling to have faith. I mean, you know, what would you tell people right now? Yeah. Well, it makes me think of, um, one, it, First thing it makes me think of um, Psalms thirty seven four, you know, take delight in the Lord and He'll give the desires of your heart. You know, um, that's the first thing. Take delight in the Lord. Yeah. I mean, we are living proof. We're sitting here. We're living proof of what Christ can do. Take us from dead in sin, dead in the world, not having no hope, to radically changing our lives, to giving us a heart for people, loving on people, wanting to change the world. You know, be different or yeah, difference makers, right? Mm-hmm. And but now, and also that don't be committed, don't just be committed, be surrendered to God That's with good. everything, surrender everything to Him. Mm-hmm. So if you're just committed, you can only be committed for so long, right? You know, so you got to surrender everything to Him, and you'll just watch how He'll change your life and the, the miracles He'll do yeah. in your life. That's really good. Yeah, I know Maddie's. You know, recently accepted the call of ministry upon her life and she's you know discerning what that looks like and things you know of that nature and so yeah. you know, I know she's curious to ask you just kind of going forward you know the plans for you and yeah. uh, what that looks like yeah, yeah. Um, so what's next I mean yeah, yeah, yeah I mean I've, well you know I've been praying honestly I've been fasting I've been doing everything I've I've been asking of course people, yeah of course you know what what do you think I should do for the Lord? And, but um, I'm I'm in this waiting season, and I'm just waiting. And uh, but I know right now the Lord's called me to get in the leadership to do everything I can do. You know, he, he's telling me I've always I've told Dylan that I called him one night and I and I was pretty broken. I said, "All right, D," I said, "I'm giving in." I said, "I'm giving in." I I know God is telling me to call me tell my story. He's told me that. So I've been writing my story, writing it down and, mm-hmm. and telling people. And, and what's amazing is our, our my church is going through this series uh, through Acts. And he told uh, we were called to share um, over 300 gospel conversations. And um, I don't know exactly how many I've shared, but every person I came in contact with, like I would make it a point to share my story with people right. That's awesome. because it was from my heart. Right. And so, you know, I, I know God's calling me to share my story with others. So yeah. thank you guys for allowing me to share my story. Yes. Yeah. You know, I just can't wait to see how God keeps using me to share my story and to share hope with others. Amen. Yeah. Well, man, it's been a privilege and honor to have you hey, here today. Yeah, it's been. From little hellions growing up on the north side of Springfield right. to now, um, dude, it feels like every I don't know two months, three months we get together over Chipotle yeah. and uh, you know just hang right. out together, you know. And, but dude, it's been cur- um, incredible and encouraging to watch man the growth in you. And I know you haven't been perfect, none of us have been perfect, but man, like mm. you love the Lord, and it's evident. And you Thank could be you, doing man. anything else, but man, you've stayed the course, man. And Dude, you're one, I always tell you, one of my greatest friends, but also one of my greatest inspirations. Yeah. And, Thanks for and I remember, Likewise. Um, yeah. I remember about a year ago uh, or two, we met at Panera, and yeah. you didn't realize this, but you know, I was getting in my car, and um, 
you know, you're getting in your car because you can drive. You know, you have that set up with your hands to be able to drive. And I just remember, you, you know, watching you get in and out of your car. And for you, it's just normal. You know, for you, it was just normal for you to be able to sit down and you know, begin to drive. But for me, I was looking because I was going through some stressful you know, scenarios, you know, within my life. And I looked, I'm like, if that dude can do it. I can do it, yeah. you know. And so, man, yeah. if, if uh, anything, dude, I mean, your story tells um, about God's grace, number one. Thank but number you, two, yeah. perseverance. Man, when I think you, it's perseverance. So, man, we love you and we're proud of you, dude. Thanks, and can't wait bro. to see what God does through you. Love you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so that these episodes are sent to you each month along with our Life and Leadership podcast that shares content about the behind the scenes in our own lives and also talk about various leadership principles that we found to be beneficial in our own life and ministry. Also, check out our midweek message and worship podcast that's released every Thursday. Thanks for hanging out with us.